Dr. Philip Baldoff. He's with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and he's going to be giving us an uh, Asian Longhorn, what it says right there, Asian Longhorn Beetle Program update. Uh, Dr. Baldoff has been the project director for the Asian Longhorn Beetle Eradication, er, Eradication Project in Ohio since April of 2012. Philip came to the ALB program from the Avaca Work Unit in Western New York, where he supervised and participated in a wide range of active programs like Emerald Ash Borer, Golden Nematode, Gypsy Moth, Export Certification, and Import Inspection, to name a few. Before his time in New York, Philip worked with the Pale Cyst Nematode Program in Idaho Falls, Idaho, as a supervisor and an officer. And prior to beginning his career with USDA, Philip earned his uh, PhD from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, in plant pathology by researching potato viruses. He also earned a BS from the University of Maryland College Park in general biology and an AS from Ricks College, which is now called Brigham Young University, Idaho, in Rexburg, Idaho, in ecology and wildlife management. Again, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A and the chat, of course, for the programmatic questions. And with that, it's time for Phil to take it away. Thank you, and thank you for the update, and welcome to, uh, to the presentation. <clears throat> I find it helpful uh, to provide some taxonomic orientation to ALB early on in the presentation so we know where ALB falls in relation to other organisms. ALB, or Anaplophora glabropenis, is in the Cerambicid, or long horned beetle family. Saying these beetles have long horns is a misrepresentation as they don't have any horns at all. As you might have guessed, the long antennae are where the longhorn beetles derive that common name. The tree types that ALB can complete its life cycle in are called host trees. In the United States, regulated ALB host trees include all species of the 12 types of trees listed here. Ash, birch, elm, golden rain tree, horse chestnut and buckeye, Katsura, London plane tree and sycamore, maple, mimosa, mountain ash, poplar, and willow. Maple tree species are preferred over all others, which is why the leaves of several different types of maple species are shown in this slide. To provide context <coughs> to this map, let me first point out that the yellow indicates maple forests. And in other words, the areas in yellow on the map are forests where ALB could readily find suitable host material to consume and reproduce in and presumably thrive. The red squares indicate active ALB infestations and white squares indicate states where ALB has been eradicated. The first detection of ALB in the US was in New York in 1996, followed by Illinois, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Ohio, and most recently, South Carolina. ALB eradication was declared in Illinois, New Jersey, and portions of New York, portions of Massachusetts, and portions of Ohio. Surveys and other eradication efforts are ongoing in New York, Massachusetts, Ohio, and South Carolina. This timeline shows some of the same data from the map shown on the previous slide, but in a different format with additional details. The point of this slide is so you can see how different ALB infestations relate to each other in time. For example, the most recent uh, ALB infestation detected in the United States in Hollywood, South Carolina was just detected last year in uh, 2020. And it's still an active infestation, meaning ALB infested trees are still being detected and beetles are still present. The ALB infestation in Bethel, Ohio was first detected in 2011. <clears throat> and it is also still an active infestation. Although satellite infestations have been uh, eradicated uh, in nearby townships, 
and that's indicated by the dark bar for Monroe, Stone Lake, and Batavia Townships. The infestations depicted in the other states were detected earlier than South Carolina and Ohio infestations, and some of them have been eradicated. And some, like Western Massachusetts, Amityville, New York, on Long Island, uh, are still active. I also want to call out that ALB is not just a problem in, US, in the US. There have been multiple European infestations, as well as Canadian infestations detected, some of which have been eradicated and some of which have not. The ALB life cycle goes through complete metamorphosis, sorry, metamorphosis, meaning the insect passes through distinct egg, larval, pupil, and adult stages, and the larva does not resemble the adult. The whole process takes approximately 887 growing degree days. Uh, growing degree days are not the same thing as our normal 24 hour days and are governed by temperature. In other words, in warmer climates like the South Carolina low country, uh, the life cycle can be accelerated when compared to cooler climates. When ALB adults emerge, they mate and the female will chew holes into trees called oviposition pits or egg sites, which are shown here. Uh, in this picture, there are brighter or newer egg sites visible and older, darker egg sites visible too. She will oviposit one egg per site and can lay up to 90 eggs total. After those beetles that start as eggs go through complete metamorphosis, the ALB adults emerge and leave more holes called emergence holes or exit holes. There were over 800 exit holes on this red maple in New Jersey after seven years of infestation. The uh, warehouse shown in the background uh, is the probable point of ALB introduction into New Jersey. <clears throat> All the damage caused by the larval tunneling through the tree can kill the tree outright, as what likely occurred to this tree shown. ALB can also kill trees by compromising the structural integrity such that branches easily break, decreasing the tree's ability to produce carbohydrates through photosynthesis. As the larvae feed, they form tunnels or galleries in tree trunks and branches. If you have a fallen branch or a cutting infested wood, you may see this uh, internal tunneling. Um, Sawdust-like material called frass is insect excrement, and it can be found packed inside the galleries and at branch unions or at the base of infested trees as the frass gets pushed out of the overposition pits and other holes caused by the tunneling. From pupa, Adult beetles emerge, and in the warmer months, they chew their way out of the tree. The picture at the top right is of an adult chewing to get out of the tree. I'll show you a movie of this process on the next slide. The picture on the bottom left is of an adult emerging out of an exit hole. One of our contract surveyors was heading out of the woods one day and spotted an ALB emergence that had just started. He didn't have a video recorder handy, so he stayed there and took a picture every few minutes to document the emergence progression. The whole process from start to finish took close to 45 minutes. And as soon as this last picture was taken, the beetle was captured and killed because we are an eradication program. Uh, there's a ton of data on this slide and I want to help you understand all of it. First, let's talk about infestation levels and what the various levels mean. An A-level infestation indicates that there are only egg sites. A B-level infestation indicates that there are uh, between one and 10 exit holes 
a sea level infestation indicates that it is greater than 10 or 10 or greater and less than 100. And a D is 100 or greater exit holes. The numbers presented in the table are the number of infested trees detected in Ohio by genus and species and by infestation level. There are several take home messages here with the first being, as mentioned previously, that by far and away maples are the most numerous infested trees being detected in Ohio, as well as other states with ALB infestations. It's not even close. Um, another take home message is that maples are more heavily infested than other tree types as indicated by the infestation levels detected. In Ohio, we have found hundreds of C and D level uh, infestations. Um, <clears throat> and, but only three elms and one poplar that have reached C level infestation. And no trees besides maples have reached a D level infestation. Another thing to point out here is what's missing. Recall on the previous slide how I said there were 12 genera that are host trees to ALB. In Ohio, we have not detected any ALB infested ash, golden rain tree, catsura, mimosa, or mountain ash. This slide highlights the ongoing cooperative relationship the USDA has with state partnering agencies in states with active ALB infestations. I'll use Ohio as an example, because that's where I currently work, and there I am, Philip Baldoff, Program Director. <clears throat> um, in Ohio, we are partnered with the Ohio Department of Agriculture, and together, we run the eradication program. In South Carolina, shown on the bottom left, the arrangement is a little bit different from other states as according to South Carolina statute, the plant regulatory authority resides with Clemson University instead of a state agency. But the process and cooperative nature of the program is still pretty much the same. If an ALB eradication program were ever needed in Kentucky, I imagine the arrangement in Kentucky would be similar to the arrangements in South Carolina with Clemson, since the state plant regulatory authority in Kentucky rests with the University of Kentucky. Massachusetts is a little bit unique in that the SPRO or the state plant regulatory authority is in a different department from the ALB program's main cooperator, the Department of Conservation and Recreation. I'll use Ohio as the example when discussing using quarantines to restrict the artificial movement of regulated materials. Soon after ALB was detected in 2011 in Ohio, the main quarantine was codified, and that included Tate Township, East Fork State Park, and portions of the East Fork Wildlife Area. The quarantine shown in red here. There are lots of details spelled out in the regulations, but the main purpose of the quarantine is to restrict human assisted movement of materials that could spread ALB to new areas. In essence, the quarantine makes it illegal to move ALB or anything that could harbor any ALB life stage outside of the quarantine boundary. Outreach is a large component of all ALB eradication programs as it was and is in Ohio. <clears throat> um, we reached enough people about ALB and the new quarantine in Tate Township that property owners in surrounding communities learned about ALB. In two cases, we learned about uh, property owners who had previously moved firewood from Tate Township. This movement had occurred prior to the ALB quarantine around Tate Township going into effect. So they hadn't done anything illegal, but when they didn't burn all the firewood over the winter, ALB had emerged from the firewood during the following summer and started in uh, new infestations, which is what led to two additional, what we call satellite quarantines, 
those are shown here in, in blue in Monroe Township as well as Batavia Stonelick Township. Uh, since we caught the infestations in those satellite quarantines early on, ALB did not have as long to reproduce and spread. So we were able to eradicate those infestations relatively quickly. Um, as what was mentioned in the previous uh, talk, when you hear people talk about the dangers of moving firewood, uh, slogans like burn it where you buy it and other related slogans, the point is to specifically prevent this kind of human assisted spread of an invasive species. The various color designations on this map indicate where we have surveyed and how many times we have surveyed there. Even though our surveyors are really good at identifying ALB damage, the damage can be difficult to detect and we don't find all the infested trees, which means we have to go back to properties and conduct resurveys. We usually won't come back to survey any given property until at least a year, usually longer, has gone by since our last survey. This is for several reasons, with one being that we don't want to overly annoy the property owners. Uh, and another reason for resurvey delays is because if there is a missed ALB infested tree present on the property, the damage tends to become more severe and therefore more readily visible over time and we will be unlikely to miss it again. All the bright green dots shown on this map represent ALB infested trees. All the gray dots represent ALB infested trees that have already been removed. In other words, if we were to go back in time, all the gray dots at one point or another would start out as bright green dots. When we detect ALB infested trees and complete the surveys on the property, all pertinent data about those infested trees gets passed to our team that runs the tree removal component of our program. So the infested trees can be queued up for removal. Our removals team is always chasing our surveyors as they detect infested trees. Sometimes our removals team almost catches up to our surveyors such that we are left with fewer and fewer infested trees standing. These times are indicated by the negative slopes that lead to low points on this graph. The rises that lead to peaks <clears throat> on the graph are when surveyors are detecting more ALB infested trees than we are able to remove. These peaks and valleys are largely driven by where we are directing surveyors to go and how heavily infested those areas are. When we survey in areas that are heavily infested, detections get ahead of removals, and when we survey in areas that are lightly infested, removals catch up. Notice that the two highest peaks after the first peak are, um, are lower than the prior high peaks. I expect this trend to continue until we have removed all infested trees and can't, can't find any more, which is what we call eradication. Up to now, I've been focusing on infested tree detections and removals, but we also conduct what we call high-risk coast tree removals. The areas shaded in orange on this map are where we where high-risk coast removals have been removed uh, or conducted in the Ohio ALB quarantine. Uh, High-risk host trees are ALB host trees that are within a half mile of any known ALB infested tree, which due to proximity to infested trees are at an elevated risk of also being infested. The program does not have the resources to remove all the high-risk host trees that exist in the various quarantines. So we prioritize where high-risk host trees will get removed based on risk. We, see, uh, we seek to remove infested trees aggressively. And if a property owner objects, we will seek a legal solution, which could involve us showing up with a warrant. The ALB program takes a more measured approach to high-risk coast tree removals and will only remove high-risk coast trees with property owner permission. 
it's important for the ALB program to understand how long ALB has been infesting areas so that we can have a better chance of identifying the pathway that led to the infestation <clears throat> so the pathway can be closed to prevent additional introductions. It is also important to understand how long ALB takes to complete its life cycle. Dendrochronology studies are used to age infestations. If you cut a living ALB infested tree down, you can count the growth rings back to age healed over signs of infestation. The tree shown here was cut in Ohio in 2016, which is indicated on the, by the outside ring. And counting growth rings back to the healed over exit hole shown here indicated that the exit hole was created in 2012, four years earlier. There is active research underway to develop the most effective trap design and lure that can be used to monitor ALB infestations. Shown here is a panel trap with a collection basin on the bottom hung in an ALB infested tree in South Carolina. You can see an exposed exit hole in the tree right there, next to the trap. Uh, the idea is that ALB adults would be attracted to the lure and try to land on the panels. Panels are coated with fluon, which makes the panels slippery. So the ALB falls into the collection basin down at the bottom uh, where it's trapped and killed and then collected and identified. As I mentioned, there is active research in this area underway now, but we haven't yet found a lure that is effective for field applications. The ALB program is big on outreach, as I think I already mentioned, and we try to get creative when it seems appropriate to do so, um, which is shown here by our climbers. <coughs> Uh, where one of them dressed up in an ALB costume as part of an out outreach uh, demonstration. Our thinking on this is that there are a lot more trees out there than we have staff working for the program. If we can multiply the number of eyes that are trained on how to recognize ALB and signs of ALB damage, we'll be more likely to get reports about potential new infestations which in turn will make it more likely that we will be able to quickly eliminate the new infestations as early detection is key. Of course, we have a strong online presence as well. For more information, including maps, videos, photographs, publications, and other useful resources, please visit www.asianlonghornedbeetle.com. And I think that link will go into the to the chat. <clears throat> Information is also available through the stakeholder registry, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, this slide kind of gives you a synopsis of the Ohio ALB program and the operations conducted uh, since the start of the program, really. The total number of surveys conducted, we're over three and a half million, which is just amazing to me. Um, we have detected just over 21,000 infested trees and the removals team, like I already mentioned, they're, they're working to catch up to the number of detected infested trees and they're at just over 20,000 trees removed. Um, for high risk host trees, we've removed over 90,000 uh, of them and we've also conducted some chemical treatments with aminoclopred, uh, and we've done over 13,000 of those. There has also been a replant uh, component of our program over the years, and they've replanted over 3,000 uh, non-host trees in the quarantine area. Now I wanna to transition to the newest ALB infestation uh, in South Carolina that I've already kind of briefly mentioned about. ALB was detected in Charleston County, South Carolina in May of 2020. And after several months of surveys to determine the extent of the infested area, a quarantine was put in place in October of 2020 
which is indicated by the red dotted line, uh, which measured about 58 square miles. Since then, the state expanded their quarantine over here onto the west side for a total of 73 square miles. The federal quarantine hasn't caught up just yet to the state quarantine, but will at some point. But before that happens, the quarantine will likely be expanded again to account for a new, a new detection, which occurred in Dorchester County, outside of the existing quarantine boundaries. Philip, you have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, these expansions come with the territory when hunting ALB, and shouldn't be that surprising. For example, the Massachusetts quarantine expanded 11 times before they got to where they are now, which is finding hardly, which is not finding hardly any infested trees. The program in South Carolina is just getting started, but has already detected over 4,000 infested trees, which are indicated by the red points shown on the map. The pink points are negative tree surveys. We will have some challenges in South Carolina, <clears throat> unique from the other more northern infestations, like expansive forested wetlands, otherwise known as swamps, with plenty of hurricanes, alligators, and venomous snakes, to name a few. Uh, I was in South Carolina for two months this summer, uh, running the eradication program and getting it started, and then again for another six weeks at the end of 2020 and into the start of 2021. There are several active areas of research underway in South Carolina that I wanna talk about briefly. One research effort is to verify the model that suggests ALB can complete its life cycle in less than a year in South Carolina. And in initial data suggests that ALB can reproduce in one season. In other words, an egg laid in the spring can lead to an emerged adult ALB in that same year. Researchers are also trying to determine how long the infestation has been in South Carolina. Um, shown here in this picture uh, as a stack of firewood, a, a property owner reported his sick, it, sick maple yard trees, some of which he had already cut down for firewood. Uh, I sifted through this pile piece by piece and found the oldest looking signs of ALB infestation. Uh, and under permit, I securely sent the pieces off for analysis. The dendrochronology work done so far suggests that ALB has been in South Carolina since at least 2012. With, with infested material and larva in hand, the researchers also did some genetic work and determined that according to the markers they use, the ALB population in South Carolina is 100% matched to the ALB population in Ohio. Even though this graphic borrowed from Dave Coyle, a Clemson researcher, suggests the ALB moved from Ohio to South Carolina, there are other possible conclusions too, like both infestations could have been started by beetles from the same place in Asia. I'm not sure we will ever know how ALB got to South Carolina, but there are plenty of other options like international shipments directly from Asia to one of the nearby ports with the port of Charleston being 20 miles away and Savannah 90 miles away. Could also be like uh, campers moving firewood to the large RV park, which is located in a particularly heavily infested area in the South Carolina quarantine or some other vacationers, as that area is a big vacation destination, or some other route. Uh, <clears throat> there is an active CSX freight line that runs through the middle of the South Carolina quarantine. Like I said, I'm not sure we will ever have a definitive answer. Um, so this slide, uh, I took this picture over this last summer. Um, it's part of a Charleston County uh, Park, the really nice boardwalk that goes through the marshland out to this island in the Stono River. Um, I took this picture because after I visited that park, 
uh, realize that the island is full of ALD. Um, almost all the all the host trees on the island are are infested. Um, it's going to be a challenge of accessing those uh, trees with the boardwalk boardwalk being the only way to do it uh, on dry ground. Um, you could also get there by boat, of course, but we'll see how it how it goes. Bill, you have one minute. This picture encapsulates the South Carolina ALB program in my mind. It's a five acre pond where nuisance alligators are deposited. Also, uh, there are federally protected wood storks that nest on the island. I've circled the, uh, some of the nests that were there. I think there were over 20 nests on that island that I could count. And that's what the uh, wood storks look like um, when they're present. Um, if there are ALB host trees on the island, they will most certainly be infested as every host tree surrounding the island is already detected as infested, as indicated by the red dots on this map. Um, the island's indicated by this arrow. We haven't actually done the survey on that island yet because we need a boat or some other way to access that island. And with that, uh, thank you for your time and I appreciate the opportunity to, to present. And I think I'll take the questions in the chat. Thanks, Phil. Really appreciate that. that some good information and some challenging uh, issues to deal with in South Carolina, short of just the, the pest in and of itself. So gators and mosquitoes and then COVID on top of that with the masks. So. Uh, thank you very much. And yeah, as, as it was said there, continue with your questions in the Q&A uh, for uh, all of the presenters so far, so you can get those uh, answered. And in, and of course, then in the chat section, you can put some chats. So thank you very much. With that, now I'll turn my portion of the, uh, the talk over to the next moderator, Alexandra. All right, thank you so much for that, Carl. And so up next, 